All right, in this lecture, we're going to cover the anatomy and the clinical pearls relevant to the elbow joint. And to start off, we're going to talk about the components. And to really get into the components of the joint, um, we're going to go to the skeletal model and look at the bony parts. Now, the elbow joint consists of three joints. It, the first, the humeral radial joint, which is the capitulum of the humerus, articulates with the radial head here. And then you have the humeral ulnar joint, which involves the trochlea of the humerus, articulating with the trochlear notch of the ulna, which is this depression here in the, in the proximal ulna that receives the trochlea of the humerus. Now, from the posterior surface of the distal humerus, you have this depression in here called the olecranon fossa. And what that receives is the olecranon process of the ulna here. So during elbow extension, the, el the olecranon process is received by this olecranon fossa within the humerus, and that enables extension of the elbow, just like that. Okay, so just to describe the movements of the elbow joint and the muscles involved, so there's, there's, two, may, there's two movements, extension and flexion. And extension is mainly carried out by the triceps muscles. So if we look at the triceps muscle here, which we talked about in the arm lecture, it attaches on the electron of the ulna. Again, muscles contract, they come closer together, it pulls it out this way. On the flexion side, you have the brachialis muscle is the major flexor, and then it's assisted by the biceps brachii and actually the brachioradialis muscle, which is a forearm muscle, which we'll talk about in the, in the uh, forearm lecture. So here's your brachialis muscle right here, and it's kind of traveling deep to the uh, biceps here, and it crosses over the elbow joint, and again, same thing, it contracts, brings closer together, it's going to bring the elbow joint this way, flexing it. Now lastly, we're going to talk about the proximal radial ulnar joint. Now there's two radial ulnar joints, proximal and distal. The distal is near the wrist. We'll talk about that in subsequent lectures. The proximal here is this joint right here, which is just distal to the elbow joint. This joint is formed by the radial notch of the ulna, so this depression in here, receiving the head of the radius. So you have the head of the radius, which rests in this uh, radial notch, and what that allows is, is you, it allows this circular formation of the radial head to swivel or rotate back and forth, back and forth, giving you pronation and supination motions. Another thing to note is that the annular ligament, which is a fibrous ligament that encircles the head of the radius, it circles around and encloses the head of the radius in, within this joint. All right, so now we're going to talk about the ligaments uh, involved in the elbow joint, the major ones. Um, first, to kind of get us oriented here with the diagram. Um, we have a medial view here, and then a lateral view here. And first ligament is the annular ligament. Now this is a fibrous ligament, and we'll circle it here and then here. In this ligament, it's a, it's, it encircles the entire uh, radius head, which is this part here that articulates um, with the humerus. And the only part it doesn't uh, articulate with the radius is, is the part of the radius um, that articulates with the radial notch of the ulna. So there's, a, there's the radial notch on the ulna, which articulates with the radius, and that's the only place the uh, annular ligament doesn't uh, attach to. Um, and then a uh, thing to note is that it fuses with the radial collateral ligament, which is this uh, ligament found here on the, radi on the radial or lateral side of the elbow joint. So you can see it actually, this diagram does a good job of showing that, that fusion. And while we're over here, we'll talk about the radial collateral ligament. It attaches from the lateral epicondyle um, to the radial notch of the ulna and the annular ligament. So it attaches down here on the ulna, the radial notch. On the medial side, the ulnar collateral ligament is the major ligament, and you'll see that here. It's this uh, structure right here. It attaches from the medial epicondyle um, to the coronine process and olecranon of the ulna. Um, so here's your coronine process here. Here's your olecran on here, so it attaches to these two bony structures, medial epicondyle of the humerus. All right, so now we're talking about the blood vessels that travel around in the elbow region. Um, so the brachial artery, we talked about that in the arm, it travels down, it travels in the cubital fossa here. One thing we've mentioned before is, we'll just point out again, is you can palpate the brachial pulse just over the medial epicondyle here, so you can get the pulse there. Um, Another thing is, is when taking a blood pressure, so, you know, you'll have someone, you know, put the cuff on and, you know, they'll inflate it up, you know, put some pressure around the, what they're doing is putting pressure on the brachial artery. And then they're listening for um, the thrush, like the thrill of blood or the jet of blood uh, 
uh, flowing distal to the cuff to get you your top number and your bottom number. So your top would be like in a normal person, 120 over 80, be your 120, bottom number 80. So you're listening for those two thrills. You would palp it or you would put your stethoscope here and that would that's where you would listen for your thrills of blood is just over is just distal to the to the cuff on uh, this area here um, the profunda brachia it gives off the, this radial collateral branch um, which helps form this anastomosis network around the around the elbow and this exists it's it's created by both this radial collateral branch and then also other um, branches as well that are coming off the brachial artery and this allows for collateral circle circulation and really the biggest um, uh, situation that would be helpful in is is if the brachial artery were tied off around the elbow so if you had um, some kind of obstruction to flow um, or you know it was something blocking it or tying it off it enables blood to get around this to bypass this and then still get to you know still get to the uh, Upper, the distal upper extremity and ensure blood flow and prevent limb ischemia. An important vein to talk about here is the median cubital vein. So you can see it here in this diagram and it bridges, um, it's a superficial vein and it bridges the other two major um, superficial veins. So the cephalic vein and then the basilic vein, the cephalic travels up on the lateral side, the basilic travels the medial side here. And the, the median cubital vein um, is a bridge between them. It's also given that it's it's very superficial. It's in the elbow region. It's often used for um, injections, um, blood transfusions, and IV placements. Um, it lies super just superficial to the bicipital aponeurosis, which is like a sheath over here that protects the cubital fossa, and it also protects the brachial arteries. An important vein to talk about here is the median cubital vein. So you can see it here in this diagram, and it bridges. Um, it's a superficial vein, and it bridges the other two major. Um, superficial vein. So the cephalic vein and then the basilic vein. The cephalic travels up on the lateral side. The basilic travels the medial side here. And the the median cubital vein um, is a bridge between them. It's also given that it's it's very superficial. It's in the elbow region. It's often used for um, injections, um, blood transfusions, and IV placements. Um, it lies super, just superficial to the bicipital aponeurosis, which is like a sheath over here that protects the cubital fossa, and it also protects the brachial arteries. It's also, unfortunately, a place where um, IV drug users will use to shoot themselves up. Now, the cubital fossa, what this is, it's, it's just a space. It's a triangular depression in the ventral side of the elbow. And so the boundaries, um, superiorly, it's, it's like a horizontal line between the medial and, and lateral epicondyle. So... If we go medial here, lateral here, those two epicondyles, so that's an imaginary line between the two. Um, the medial border would be the, um, the lateral border of pronator teres. So here's your pronator teres muscle here. And then you have your lateral border, lateral border here. Or ex excuse me, medial border. The medial border of the cubital fossa is the lateral border of pronator teres. Then the lateral border of the cubital fossa is this medial border of brachioradialis, this muscle here. And um, the apex is formed by the meeting of these two points. And then um, the roof is this kind of the fascia and skin that overlies us, the bicipital aponeurosis that we've been talking about. And then the floor is the brachialis muscle, which is traveling in here, and um, the supinator muscle as well, which is in, in here. So the contents that, that run through here, um, again, just to kind of give you, a, it's about right here, right here, right here. That's our triangle. Um, you have the radial nerve that travels in here. So here's your radial nerve traveling in. Um, and it travels in between brachioradialis, this muscle here, and the brachialis muscle. Um, this is not always, it just depends on your source. Um, I guess be aware of this, that this can, tra this can be considered as part of the triangle. You know, as far as your specific course, you just check with your professor. Um, otherwise, but the main the main contents are the, are these three here. These these are always a constant: biceps brachii tendon, um, which is you, you can see the biceps brachii muscle here. The tendon is coming in here um, and inserting on the radius here on the radial tuberosity, um, and then you have the brachial the the brachial artery, and um, which is traveling in here, and then you have the median nerve. And so to round out this uh, lecture, we're going to talk about the clinical pearls around the elbow. So first we'll talk about cubital tunnel syndrome. 
Now, the cubital tunnel syndrome is kind of analogous to carpal tunnel syndrome, which is in the hand. We'll talk about that in the hand lecture. So the cubital tunnel, it's an anatomical space or tunnel, and it's in the medial side of the dorsal uh, elbow. And it's where the ulnar nerve travels kind of around the around and in the elbow. And the borders really are, so if you draw you know, a humerus down like this, and you have that kind of prominent medial epicondyle out like that, and then you have your lateral, and then your medial here, and then the ulnar nerve is kind of traveling down here, travels behind the uh, medial epicondyle, and then emerges back here into the forearm. Okay, so it travels around that medial epicondyle. It's also the olecranon process, which kind of comes up here, um, and then it goes between kind of the two the two heads of flexor carpi ray uh, flexor carpi ulnaris, which is a muscle forearm muscle on the medial side. So it travels through those two sides through the two heads of that muscle while it's after it travels around the medial epicondyle. So that whole structure kind of forms the borders of the tunnel. And what happens is, is you can get chronic compression of the ulnar nerve within the cubital tunnel. And again, so you have this tunnel here, right here where it's traveling through, it emerges out. And what happens is, is it, it compresses the nerve and you get ulnar nerve symptoms. So you get kind of numbness, tingling down the forearm. Um, you get it, the ulnar nerve distribution in the hand is more is the medial side of both the palmar and dorsal surface of the hand. So you get can get a lot of numbness and tingling in here. Um, you get motor weakness, especially in the small, um, the small finger and the ring finger, um, because those are inter those the muscles moving those are innervated by the innervated by the ulnar uh, nerve. And prolonged compression can even lead to atrophy of these muscles. And this muscle group here is called the hypothenar muscle group. Um, and so you could, if it's really bad, you can get atrophy because they're just not receiving any innervation. The symptoms are also, they're classically exacerbated by elbow flexion because elbow flexion narrows this canal. So, you, so when you flex your elbow, you narrow the, the cubital tunnel, putting even more compression on the nerve. Um, examples of that would be talking on the cell phone or elbow bent while sleeping. So you could have a patient who comes in and they're, they're saying, oh, I have numbness in the you know, medial side of my hand. I have trouble you know, with my grip, with moving, you know, the strength in my ring and my small finger. It seems that, you know, they'd say something like, oh, it seems to get worse when I talk on my phone or maybe when I wake up in the morning. Those are all things that are cueing you into cubital tunnel syndrome. Um, the way you do the official, you can diagnose these um, clinically. You can do what's called a Tunnel test where you tap your finger here. If it's positive, they'll have like a jolt of electrical feeling down um, or will reproduce their symptoms of kind of tingling and numbness um, in that area. Um, you also do your, you know, your physical exam on their hand to, sh to identify the weakness and numbness. Um, to really confirm the diagnosis, you do an EMG or a nerve conduction study, and that's, you know, it measures the conduction of the all of the nerve throughout the upper extremity. That could rule out, you know, because a brachial plexus lesion could affect the ulnar nerve. Also, the cervical spine lesion, you know, in the roots could affect the ulnar nerve. So that would rule that out. And then what do you do to treat this? You can give them a brace to kind of keep this tunnel as open as possible, put the elbow in a proper position, or you can do uh, surgical, you can go in and do surgery and uh, similar to carpal tunnel surgery, you would go in and you, you um, cut, the, cut the cubital tunnel in certain areas and help release pressure off the nerve. Supracondylar humerus fracture, these are very, these are very common in children. Um, what you'll see on an x-ray is kind of fat pads in this area. You'll see them displaced. That's kind of a sign you might see on a test uh, question. The mechanism of injury is usually falling on an outstretched hand, so like extend, you know, falling out with the elbow fully extended. Um, the big thing to note here is this can cause AIN, which is a, we'll talk about more in the forearm lecture, which is a branch of the median nerve, so median nerve palsy. And we'll point that out here. This is, so here's the median nerve traveling in here. Here's your AIN branching off here. So what you can, when you have a fracture, you can have this space, this particular part of the humerus really displace forward and damage the median nerve or its branches, which would be the AIN nerve branching off here. Um, and so really what that would, can cause you is the AI, AIN innervates um, muscles of the forearm that act on the thumb and the fingers. And so what you can really have is, is they're not able to flex their thumb IP joint or the DIP joints of the index finger. Um, you can also get in this region, given that the radial nerve is also traveling in this area, so you have the radial nerve traveling here, you can also get it where the patient is unable to extend their wrist or digits. So again, you get that wrist drop 
because um, it's a proximal radial nerve lesion here in the forearm. Um, and then again, they also can't extend their, their fingers. Big one that you'll see a lot on tests is subluxation of the radial head. This is the classic, you know, um, where the radial head dislocates um, from the its articulation with the humerus. Um, mechanism injury is, you know, sudden pull on an extended and pronated uh, forearm. Classic example is like two parents swinging their, you know, very young child, like three or four child, swinging, like picking them up by their arms and swinging them back and forth. This dislodges out. The reason why this is really common in in, uh, in children is because the annular ligament. So here's the annular ligament wrapping around the radial head. That is weaker in children, and so it allows the radial head to kind of makes it a lot easier for the radial head to slip out. Um, on physical exam, you'll note, um, and this 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 is the kind of stuff you want to look for in test questions because they'll describe this to you. Um, these kind of buzzwords. Um, is the arm is held in an extended and pronated position, um, so the palm is faced down to the ground or dorsally. Um, they have very minimal swelling, deformity, or focal tenderness. So, so really, no you know signs of like inflammation or serious damage. It's really just the arm is held in this extended and pronated position. The way you treat treatment is kind of two ways. It's it's not an invasive treatment at all. Is you can it's usually just done in the emergency room. You hyperpronate the forearm. You put a lot of pressure on to hyperpronate it. And the idea is to just kind of just jack the radial head back into position under the annular ligament. Or what you can do is you can first you supinate the forearm. So do the reverse of pronation and then flex the elbow past 90 degrees. Because remember when you know you're supinating is the radial head is rotating in its position. So you rotate it and then you flex it. Tennis elbow, also medically called lateral epicondylitis. So what is this? It's you know inflammation of the tendons of the extensor muscles, which originate from the lateral epicondyle. So that would be in here. So you have all the, you have the lateral epicondyle wad, which is where all these extensor muscles. And it's really just from overuse. Um, the particularly it damages the extensor carpi radialis brevis muscle. Um, and it's common in certain professions, painters, plumbers, and carpenters. It's not just common in tennis players um, because they have, a, you know, these guys do a lot of extension of the elbow flexion. And the way it presents is pain on the lateral surface of the elbow here. Um, and it's exacerbated by, you know, forearm activity. They also have weak grip strength. And the reason for that is, um, you know, muscles in this area um, are control, you know, the, the movements of the fingers. Um, the treatment is always, always non-operative. This is not, it does not involve invasive therapy. It's usually rest. You give them NSAIDs, uh, physical therapy. You might give them a brace, help keep the elbow in proper position. Medial epicondylitis, also called golfer's elbow. Um, this is which affects the medial epicondyle, which is seen here. Um, again, this is, you know, it's the same thing, inflammation or damage to the flexor muscles originating. Um, its presentation is very similar to, to tennis elbow. You have you know pain and tenderness over this area um, on the medial side. Again, it's you know involved people who are doing a lot of flexion of the of the arm, kind of you know really you know overworking these muscles here. Uh, again, you can put a ster uh, for this. You can put a steroid injection. So you put a needle in uh, in here, inject some steroid, hopefully bring down the inflammation, or you just advise them to avoid um, repetitive elbow flexion. That wraps up our discussion of the elbow.